was a battle that was waged throughout the entire length of the war, from the first day to the last. And it was in every way the most decisive battle of the war, the Battle of the Atlantic. Britain's ability to feed its people and to keep its armies in the field depended entirely on the unbroken chain of supplies flowing across this ocean. The cruel sea as it became known, because in the course of this five-year battle, it claimed so many ships, so many lives. Guns, tanks, aeroplanes, ammunition, food. Every available merchant ship was pressed into service, many of them old and sluggish and little more than rust buckets. The ships were grouped into convoys, 30 or 40 or more ships at a time, and launched across the Atlantic from New York and Nova Scotia, bound for Britain. American and Canadian warships sailed with the merchant ships for the first stretch of their journey moving up and down the flanks of the convoy like sheepdogs around a flock of sheep, keeping it together, fending off the would-be attackers for a while at least. Aircraft patrols extended their protective cover a little further out into the Atlantic, but when the time came for them to turn back to their bases, America and Canada, all they could do was to signal good luck. The long lines of merchant ships needed all the luck they could get. They were on their own, plodding along at the speed of the oldest and slowest ships, out into the black gap as it became known, between the protective screens of warships and planes on either side of the Atlantic. Lying in wait for them out there in the darkness were the wolf packs, the deadly German U-boats. Every U-boat captain was a key player in the battle. They knew that they could win the war for Germany. If they could cut this main artery of supplies across the Atlantic, Britain would be starved into submission in a matter of a few weeks. Slowly, steadily, the U-boats crept towards the achievement of that target. The Germans had a menacing fleet of over a hundred U-boats operating in the North Atlantic, all with highly disciplined commanders, all playing to the same game plan, namely lie in wait for the convoy, ambush it, and then stay with it and pick off the ships one by one. What's more, it was working. In the early months and years of the war, hundreds of Allied ships were sent to the bottom, far faster than they could be replaced. Now, the game plan had been devised by a brilliant German submariner, Admiral Karl Dönitz, and it depended on two key factors. The first was tight central control from his command bunker in France, so that the wolf patch could be positioned using the very latest intelligence on the convoy's routes. But the most important was the secrecy of the naval Enigma codes, so that not a word of the top secret signals sent to the U-boat commanders could be read by the Allied codebreakers. Karl Dönitz was a ruthless disciplinarian. From his command centre on the Biscay coast at Lorient, he exercised the strongest central control. And the discipline he imposed in the use of the Enigma encoding machines was also relentless, by far the tightest discipline of all the German armed forces. For the British codebreakers at Bletchley Park, the vital U-boat signals presented an immense challenge. But as the shipping losses mounted, they simply couldn't break into the German naval codes to help reduce the sinkings. A typical Atlantic U-boat leaves the submarine pens at breast, bound for the waters off the American East Coast. In the early months of the war, these coastal shipping lanes became a veritable killing ground for the U-boats. They were like foxes in a chicken coop. They sank everything in sight with almost no fear of being hunted down.
All the advantage lay with the U-boats. They lay submerged during the day and then attacked the Allied ships either with torpedoes or even quite brazenly on the surface with their deck guns. Indeed, U-boats were able to operate so near the coast that torpedoes which missed their targets were often found later on the beaches. As the convoy system became more sophisticated, so Admiral Dönitz refined his wolf pack strategy, with every move controlled from the centre. On the wall of his bunker, he had a giant grid chart of the North Atlantic. The U-boats were ordered to take up positions on the grid by a sequence of letters and figures. Sent in code, these coordinates were meaningless to the Allied eavesdroppers, even if the signals were intercepted. The U-boats in the wolf pack were set up as an ambush, lying in wait, spaced out at intervals across the line of an approaching convoy. Detailed knowledge of the convoy's course came from a variety of sources. Germany's own code-breaking efforts, enemy agents in American ports mingling with the merchant seamen, sightings by patrolling U-boats, giant long-range Focke-Wulf 200 reconnaissance aircraft. The strategy was brilliantly successful. Dönitz was winning the Battle of the Atlantic and close to winning the war for Germany. The key to his success was the strictness of his discipline in the use of the Enigma codes. The signals simply couldn't be penetrated. Admiral Dönitz, who was the commander of U-boats for the German Navy, wanted to control his U-boats from a central point for his wolf pack strategy. He felt that only a central coordination of the many submarines attacking a convoy guaranteed success. This required communications back and forth between the wolf packs and the central command post where he was. Obviously, these communications had to be secret or the enemy would be able to take counteractions. To maintain the secrecy of these communications, he required the Enigma cipher machine. And so you might say that to a certain extent, the Wolfpack strategy of Karl Dönitz depended absolutely on the secrecy of the Enigma cipher machine. Every U-boat crew was indoctrinated with the need for the tightest discipline. All the human idiosyncrasies and carelessness which had enabled the British code breakers to crack the German army and Air Force codes were eliminated by the rigorous encoding methods imposed by Karl Dönitz. At Bletchley Park, this period became known as the blackout. For a while, the only light in the darkness was a brilliant new invention fitted to Allied escorts. It was nicknamed Hafta, which stood for high frequency direction finding. If it could pick up a radio signal from a transmitting submarine, it could plot the boat's position very accurately. But the Germans knew this. As a result, they kept their U-boat transmissions to a minimum to foil the escort ships. Dönitz, when um, he uh, was ordering and, and leading a campaign against the convoy, he was, of course, uh, in great need of information about the situation. And so any signal from a U-boat was a small stone in his picture of the whole battle. And so he was uh, eager to get information, and he didn't prevent the U-boats, uh, as it might have been necessary, to uh, be silent and uh, send not so many signals. And the f idea was when the U-boat is uh, in contact with the convoy, the enemy knows that the U-boats are there and uh, di uh, direction finding and, and uh, location of U-boats makes no sense because the enemy knows from the sinking of ships that there are U-boats and uh, a signal uh, makes no difference to this situation. This was uh, a reason why uh, the radio silence was not so kept so well as it might have been necessary from our knowledge. For the British convoy controllers in London and Liverpool, it was a desperate time. They were working in the dark in their efforts to avoid the U-boats. They kept up what they called a working fiction, based on things like analysis of U-boat radio signals, sightings by ships or aircraft, and of course attacks by U-boats, which revealed their position. But they knew they could well be routing these precious convoys into the path of the U-boats, rather than away from them. 
What they needed above all was some hard information from the code breakers. But that still wasn't forthcoming. The naval enigma was a more difficult uh, system to crack because the naval enigma provided keying information which eliminated the human error that had crept into the Luftwaffe keying system. As a consequence, this took away many of the handholds that the British code breakers had used to break the Air Force enigma. A major factor was that although the Navy enigma machine was essentially the same as the other services, it did have eight rotors to select from against the five for the Air Force and the Army. And the eight rotor machine produced a galactic number of cipher alphabets. The British code breakers were beating their heads against a stone wall. What was needed was a totally new approach. And one began to emerge quite by chance in 1941 during a raid by British commandos on a German-held Norwegian island. The commandos boarded a trawler called the Krebs and found some naval Enigma rotor wheels. This find triggered an idea in the mind of a young Cambridge undergraduate, Harry Hinsley, then working at Bletchley Park. He argued that if the Enigma was on this battered trawler, then it must be on all German naval ships, including the lonely and undefended weather ships positioned out in the North Atlantic for weeks at a time. Capture one of these, he proposed, and with its Enigma documents, you would immediately have an entry point into the vital U-boat signals. It was a complete gamble, but the idea was accepted. And in May 1941, three Royal Navy cruisers raced northwards from Scapa Flow to surprise and capture the weather ship Munchen. The boarding party were too late to stop the Enigma machine itself being dumped overboard. But they seized all the current documents and cipher schedules. It was something of a breakthrough at Bletchley Park. For the period covered by the schedules, the code breakers had a narrow but precious window on the naval enigma. When the window was closed, the British Navy did it again to capture the weather ship, the Lauenburg. For some strange reason, the German high command didn't tie the two together. They never linked the capture of the weather ships with the British code breakers. The capture of the German weather ships was a brilliant stratagem. It gave the British code breakers a finger hold on the otherwise impenetrable German U-boat signals. But it was overshadowed by the greatest code-breaking pinch of the entire war. Nothing less than the capture of an operational German U-boat out in mid-Atlantic, the U-110. Now the U-110 was a long-range transatlantic submarine commanded by one of Dönitz's aces, the 28-year-old Fritz Julius Lemper, who had already won the Iron Cross for his sinking of a British battleship. Fritz Lemper had sighted a large convoy 400 miles west of Ireland and reported the interception to U-boat High Command. But the transmission had been intercepted by the British escort warships. And they were able to fix the position of the U-boat with a high degree of accuracy. U-110 was attacked with depth charges by the British corvette Obricia and blown to the surface. German crewmen set scuttling charges to blow up the submarine and then abandon ship. But the charges failed to explode. As a boarding party, led by a young officer, David Baum came alongside. Climbing aboard an empty, apparently sinking U-boat was an eerie experience, as David Baum remembers. The, the 12 volt secondary lighting was on. The main lights, of course, have all been broken by all the depth charging, but there was a dim light. You could see enough, um, and it was very quiet, no generators running like you have in a ship all the time, a hum, no hum, deathly silence, just the uh, hissing, a nasty hissing noise coming out of the batteries, presumably, um, gas escaping, and then the rolling to and fro to Atlantic swell, the plop of the sea. By far, of course, the most important thing was the Enigma machine. And there it was, screwed to the cable alongside the wireless set. And um, of course, we didn't know what it was. We knew it had something to do with um, decoding, because it was a typewriter, looked like a typewriter. 
and um, my telegraphist, always carry a telegraphist and an arm boarding party, he had a screwdriver, he unscrewed it, and we passed it up. And of course, the miracle was it wasn't dropped overboard. The German sailors thought their U-boat had sunk, meant the captain was drowned. And Admiral Dönitz was convinced the submarine had gone down before a boarding party could get on board. In fact, it was taken in tow, but sank before it could reach an Allied harbour. But the real prize from the German submarine had been the Enigma documents, and these were rushed to Bletchley Park. Codebreaker Sean Wiley was working in Hut 8, the naval hut, and he still keenly remembers the arrival of the documents from U110. Oh, we were, of course, well, uh, initially absolutely delighted. I think the first pinch was very agreeably half-hearted. I think it produced half the information and we had to get the rest of it. Everyone was delighted with that. Um, the pinches differed very much in their reception by us. Sometimes it was just boring because it left us nothing to do for a month or so. Um, and sometimes it produced absolutely crucial information about short signals or something of the kind. They varied. But the initial one was absolutely essential. The documents from U110 included the current keys valid for the month of July, which enabled the British code breakers not only to read the U-boat signals, but to reconstruct the wiring for all eight Naval Enigma rotors and to work out the grid codes for the North Atlantic. The immediate result was a major victory. In the following months, all the giant supply submarines, which refueled and resupplied the U-boats in mid-Atlantic, known as milch cows, were located and sunk. These giant 2,000 ton supply submarines had been the backbone of the U-boat campaign. They could supply up to 14 U-boats on each voyage, meeting up with them, rendezvous points in lonely, out-of-the-way spots in the Atlantic. They transferred fuel and torpedoes, food, even mail from friends and family. Their loss was a decisive blow, both the morale and the entire operation ability of the U-boat fleets. However, with over 400 boats in operation and German yards building them at an astonishing rate, Dönitz could afford some losses. And despite the ability of the Allied code breakers to read his signals during this period, knowing where the wolf packs were was still only half the battle. He still had to be located and attacked. When the information provided by U110 became out of date, once again the U-boats became dominant. U-boat crews were welcomed home as heroes. Ships were still being sunk in huge numbers. It was called the second happy time. But slowly, steadily, the code breakers began to get on top of the problem. By now, America was in the war, and Washington and Bletchley Park worked hand in glove to attack the German naval codes. New weapons for hunting and killing submarines began to turn the tide of the Battle of the Atlantic. British scientists developed the highly accurate 10 centimetre radar systems, which could locate a U-boat even if only its periscope was above water, and long-range aircraft could be called in to attack with depth charges. America built dozens of small escort carriers which could sail with the convoys and pounce on the U-boats whenever they attacked. The second happy time was over. The U-boat stranglehold was broken. Hitler gave us his reason for eventually withdrawing U-boats from the Atlantic, the fact that the British 
it developed a new and powerful weapon. He was referring, of course, to 10 centimeter radar. What he didn't know was that the code breakers had at last broken the naval enigmas. When the European war ended, Admiral Dönitz sent his last signal to his remaining U-boat crews. All U-boats cease fire Dönitz. They had fought from the first day of the war to the last, and it had been a very close run thing. Well over 2,000 merchant ships were sunk, and many thousands of sailors lost their lives. Of the 842 U-boats commissioned, a huge number were sunk, 781, the highest loss rate of any service of the fighting powers. The publicly acclaimed victors were the courageous sailors and airmen who sailed the seas and attacked the U-boats. As for the men behind the scenes, the code breakers, who did so much to break the U-boat stranglehold, they had to wait for many years to get their due. To the very end of the Battle of the Atlantic, Dönitz was convinced that the U-boat Enigma remained secure and unbroken. He didn't learn of the British codebreaker's remarkable success until after the war was over in a simple telephone call.